לך אמר ליבי, בקשו פני את פניך ושם אבקש. לך אמר ליבי, בקשו פני Oh, <laughs> One of the things that was so important to us in our beginning was that we had a holy temple. And by connecting with the holy temple, we were able to recal recalibrate ourselves to be in the right place. If I were to ask, besides the stones and the wood, and the gold and the silver and the altars, what was the temple actually doing? What was the function of the temple? I come to a place that it was the battery for the God juice for people. And each sacrifice that we offered, every song that the Levites sang, did something to add to that power that was available to us for our use. So when they were saying, he whoever uh, works before Shabbos will eat on Shabbos. And if you want your prayer to be answered, you have to invest in that prayer pool, as it were, in the God field. Now, before we were talking about the I-Thou relationship, and it's not only our creation, But we have to understand something. The mind that holds the universe in existence constantly wants to communicate with us. So imagine if I had, um, I was sending you um, a message, but your computer wouldn't have the ASCII formula there. So the long letter that I'm sending you would never show up on your screen. So what's necessary is that I should know your vocabulary, that I should know what the recipient can handle. And that is, as it were, the typewriter, if I put it this way, the printer, on which God sends us messages. Dibra, Torah, Bileshon b'nei Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of human beings. Which is to say that depending on what year and what time of uh, history, what the technology was at that time, God speaks in that language. So there was a guy by the name of Korzybski who was the founder of um, semantics, who was saying that every word has to have a time binder to it. So if I say freedom, and I say 2,448 before the common era, then I talk about going out of Mitzrayim. If I say freedom in 1776, a different kind of freedom. So the words that are being used in the divine way of communicating with them, has something to do with the way in which we handle uh, language. 
and what it means to us. So you can understand that if you look at the prayer book, the Siddur, you see that it's a museum. It's not current. And that's okay, because religion has a way of being a step behind of the technology. Imagine when people wear suits, then a priest would wear a kaftan, like, you know? And when people wear kaftans, the, the, the holy people would wear loincloths, you know? And when people wear loincloths, the holy people would go naked. There's always like going back one, one level of technology. What is art? Art, for instance, if I, a sport and art. If I needed to go from one place to another, a sailboat would take me, and that would be good. But when today I'm sailing for a sport, I'm taking a technology that no longer is as vital today because we have boaters and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going back in earlier technology. When I'm doing target practice with a bow and arrow, I'm doing the same kind of thing. Constantly, there is a, a way of stepping back. Why is that necessary? Because there are archaic elements in us and we carry our ancestors in us and all that. So when, for instance, we sing uh, a melody that is uh, a Schulische melody, what happens is, ah, 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 kol nidre. What happens right away is that our ancestors, whatever is in us, begins to, to shine in us, begins to awaken in us. So we need to have history. Without history, we will lose our, our, our place. But at the same time, if you look at a tree, the history of the tree is in the rings of the tree. And that's very good, but it's dead wood. Where is the tree? The tree is in the growing edge, just that stuff that's right underneath the bark. And if you peel this off a tree, you kill a tree. So I want to say that every religion needs to have, every year, a renewal. And that's that um, growing edge that's around. But if it only had the growing edge, the first wind would throw it over. So we have to have a past and we have to have the present. Now the question is, whom do you want to address? Do you want to address Ze Eli, this is my God, Ve'an Vehu, and then I will have my personal relationship with him? Or Elohei Avid, the God of my fathers, Ve'arome Menhu, and I will exalt him? There are some people who can't make it beyond that. They haven't had personal divine experiences that they could have access to. And so therefore, they say, I have to be Yitzhak, I have to do it like my father did. I have to go exactly, say all the prayers that have been said, because that is my discipline. I may not feel anything, but it's my discipline. Professor Heschel has a good way of talking about it. He says, there was a town, and once a year, the watchmaker would come, because they didn't have their own watchmaker. And he would repair the watches that were there. The people who would every day wind the watch, even though it didn't keep the right time, their watches were easy to repair. The people who didn't wind the watches wasn't easy to repair. So he's trying to say, every morning when you're davening, what's in the sitter, you're winding the watch and you're, st you're staying, you're in there. And that's good. If you're dealing with Elohei Aviva Ramimenu, that's my father's God. Now, a lot of what my parents deposited in that God space is capital that I can draw on. That's why we speak of zechut avot, the merit, parental merit. It gives us energy, it gives us strength, it keeps us together. The wind comes and it can't throw us over. But there are some places where there is no growing edge. And there is no such a thing as, this is my God, this is my experience that I have. So it depends. Some days I find, 
Oh, I'm so tired. What am I going to do? Today I'm going to dump everything in the city, just because I'm tired, because I can't free myself to go to higher places. But there are some times when I'm, Baruch Hashem, now I'm going to juice up my Ze'eli rather than Neleke Ovi, and then I decide wherever it's going to take me, I'm going to be. So let me spell this one out. It's so beautiful and important. Rabbi Emanuel Rachman, a wonderful, wonderful person, once translated the word Yatsa Yedei Chovato as follows. He extricated himself from the grasp of obligation. Now take a look what that means. Many people were saying, okay, I did it already. You can't, you, you can't have a lien on me, you know. I extricated, I was Yoitze. I extricated myself from the grasp of obligation. That's when I feel it's an obligation. But what would be if I feel I'm doing something for my beloved? Sometimes I try and characterize what we do on Friday the following way. Imagine the boss comes for dinner and you say at, five, at 6 o'clock he'll be there. By 5.30, every dish is in the right place and the forks and everything in the right place and you leave it alone. On the other hand, if your beloved is coming, yeah, but let me move this a little bit, yeah? Here the flower better. You understand? You're never finished because it's not an obligation. You don't have a sense of obligation. You, you come with a really devotional Happy place. What, what more can I do? Ma ashiv ladunai kol tag What can I give God back for all the boons that I have received? That's, so that's wonderful. When you're in that space, to be able to, to, to have to say to yourself, I'm going to daven the whole sitter, is wasting it. Because that is a moment of grace. You, you, you know, you don't work for it. You, you get in the grace and so on. The question is public policy. And that's what you are raising. If you're going to make it so loose and you're going to say you can do it the way you want and so on and so forth, what's going to happen? You have to have a standard and so on and so forth. So I want to say in Klal Yisrael, in the whole kitten caboodle of who is a Jew, there are plenty of people who are handling that part. I let him handle that part. There are very few people who are handling this part, you know, and it has to be stated out that this part is also important. In fact, that part of what we say in the Siddur wouldn't have happened before if somebody hadn't gone, oh, wow, Adon Olam, Asher Malach Beterem Kol Yitzhivra. Before there was a world, God was king. Wow, you know. So then from that came... Uh, something to recite, you know, uh, and hallelujahs in the Baruch Shamar. So, but was the, what was the, the origin? How did it grow from? It grew from a person's personal encounter. So that's the Ze'eli Van Veyu. So I want to say, don't forget about that also. And Dafke, when you are in a place when you are not receiving grace, then you do what you have to do. Then you follow through and you say all the things that you have to say so on. I also have another trick that I do when I don't feel like davening too much, even in Hebrew from the Siddur. Then I pull out a Siddur in another language. And that's so wonderful. Buenas el Señor a los limpios de corazón. I have a, I have a, a Spanish Siddur. Yeah, or I can say Benedetto is to uh, uh, Re Nostro, you know, uh, Re dell'Universo, and I'm doing it in Italian. And um, Gelobt sei es to Gott, and so I said in German. It's wonderful. I have the other languages here, and what happens is that each time I take away another veil from what it's actually saying by going into that language. Someone I once read a science fiction story that had it this way that if you have to do scientific stuff, you do it in German. And if you want to do love stuff, you do it in French. 
And if you want to do politics, you do it in English. So that, uh, and it's true because each one of those languages has a particular quality, a, 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 a feel for it that you can do. So having said that, I want to go back some more to the business of the God space. As long as people were looking at the way in which the universe operates, they would be talking about it in terms of governance in the past. How do we do that? Who is God? Melech, Malche, Hamlochim, HaKodosh, Baruch He is the super-duper king. Where did this come from? Because in ancient days, like the time of King Solomon, he was a great king, and a whole bunch of little kings became his sons-in-law or his parents-in-law or something like this because he married their daughters and so on, so he connected with them. So the guy was the king of Jericho, and he was a vassal of the king of Jerusalem, and the king of Jerusalem was a vassal of the Melech Malchai Amlochim HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when the Shah was in, in uh, Iran, he was called the Shah in Shah, the king of kings. That's, that's the way they had it. And it goes back, way, way back to the Hittite emperor, who was the king of kings. When you have a hierarchy like this, then you don't see so much what we are contributing but it's only the boss calls and it goes down, it just goes down from hierarchy. But when we are saying that the Rabbi Nishlam Adonai Melech, so in Hasidus and Kabbalah they always explain that there can't be a king without having uh, subjects. So who makes God a king? We make God a king. We offer you the crown. We surrender to your will. We do that. So that's the contribution we make. Once you don't do with hierarchy and with government, what do you deal with? You deal with an organism. And that's what I want to get back so that we can understand. The people who want a abstract monism, it doesn't exist. The people who want an organic monism, that's a possibility. We're all cells of the greater of the greater all that there is. So the toe contributes something, and the nose contributes something, and every part of the body contributes something and receive something. So we are all connected in a kind of share of the flow that goes from, from organ to organ, from limb to limb, and so on. So now something is happening. They call it the body talk system. It's a remarkable place because somebody found out that instead of trying to find out with my diagnosis who you are and what there is, I'll ask your body. And they first began with uh, kinesiology, and now they're even beyond, way beyond that. And they point out that one of the reasons why illness happens in the body is because organs don't talk to each other. Sometimes, you know, when a gland will not get the right message from another one, Sometimes an inner organ won't get the right message from another one. So what do they do? They ask the body in which order should they begin to connect um, the various inner parts. And in this way, a person gets to a greater level of health. Now, when I ask myself that the world right now is very, very sick, and what's happened is that I just talked to a friend of mine who was at the Parliament of Religions. And again, you know, everybody says his nice thing, but nothing much happens. 
And what would have happened if all these people who were at the Parliament of Religions would have been able to say, we are cells of the greater thing and we have to work together so that there should be a shared flowing between us. So tikkun olam in the best way means for us to deposit into that uh, part that needs us to deposit something, uh, into the pool, which is Knesset Yisrael, which is the Shechina. And when the Shechina is not in exile, that's to say, when it's honored the right way, then we call this giving power to Pamalya Shalmala, to the heavenly family, as it were. It's like saying, Gadlu ladunai iti unarome mashamo yachdav, let us all increase. Yit gadal, yit gadash, we are saying, man, magnified, sanctified, put in more, put in more. So if I would be able to say, when we come to shul, we have a pushke, and we put in some money into the pushke. To be able to say, how many ergs did you put into Claudius Royal, into the healing of the planet today, and the davenin? That would be a wonderful way of, of dealing with it. Hmm. I'm going to go on to something about kavana. When you were asking the question before about the discipline and what we need to do, there is a discussion in the Talmud that says, mitzvot tzrichot kavana or non tzrichot kavana. Does a, does a mitzvah need to have intentionality behind it or not? So we say, for instance, when you're baking matzah, you know, you roll it out, you say, L'shem matzah's mitzvah, because unless you put in the kavanah that you mean that this should become the, the matzahs that could be used on Pesach, the matzahs are lacking something. And that's so amazing what, what, uh, how could I say it's lacking something that isn't physical? But now we see, yes, that in our structure, you have to put something in, and that is your intention. I take the tzitzis and I'm tying them. I say, L'shem mitzvah tzitzit. I'm doing this for the intention of the mitzvah of tzitzit. When... Uh, we are in a situation, God forbid, there has to be a divorce. Writing that bill of divorce has to be lishmo, lishma, lishem geroshin, having the man in mind particular, the woman in mind in particular, and that it should be a, po a potent instrument to be able to do it. So we see in a lot of stuff, kavana is necessary, and if kavana isn't there, then they say, tfila below. Kavana keguf beli neshama. Prayer without kavana is like a body without a soul. So you see, what energizes it is the kavana. What is the most, the ground kavana? You know, the one that has to be. And we call that kabbalat ol malchut shamayim. That's when we can say, I accept upon myself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the language is archaic. We're talking kingdom again. But if I were to say, I accept upon myself that I am an integral part of the whole and I don't want to be a cancer cell. I want to collaborate with all of life that's there. That is a good kavana. And so when someone wants to become a Jew, one of the ways in which that happens is they take a dip and they are mekabel all malchut shamayim. They say, from now on, uh, God is my boss. Then, they do another dip, and they are mekabel all mitzvot. They say, and now I take on the commandments. So now the question is sometimes, if I were to ask even the most religious person, the most observant person, and if they were totally transparent and open, and I would ask him, how well are you doing, for instance, with Loshon Hora, with uh, uh, talking ba behind a person's back in a bad way? 
would find, oh, he is very careful. He watches the salad so that there shouldn't be a worm on it and so on and so forth. And that one, they are very careful. And some other things, they're not so careful. Because everybody has a flaw. Everybody has something that they do better than something else. And so when it comes to um, respecting nature, for instance, in that way, we have been sick for a long time. Because if you look at the way in which it was in the time of Ruth, she goes out, they're cutting the wheat, and she picks up those things that poor people are entitled to pick up. Agriculture was very clear. People were doing all kinds of things with it that they had to be careful what you can plant together, what you can't plant together, and the quality of the soil and so on and so forth. So all these things were very real for us. And then came the exile, and we didn't experience that for a long time. So that people like you have to start learning it again and find out how do we become indigenous? This is a wonderful question, which is saying, what does the earth want to tell us? So one of the kavanot then, so if we were to put together what is what instructions do I have in my system files for consciousness that I'd like to live by, I would get to these instructions. A, that I'm doing this for God's sake. B, that I'm integral to the universe. C, that I want to live in such a way that it should be totally in harmony with existence. Because that's what I would... If I say the Torah created the world, so then the world is like the Torah. Sometimes we get Torah from the world. Sometimes we, 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 we give the world from the Torah, but back and forth. That, that's what an organic system is. There is a flow back and forth. So the kavanah that has to be is that kind of, uh, how would I say, an, a, a subtext. If you could imagine... I'm saying some prayers. And I'm saying, here, here, here are the words that I'm saying. Here is the translation of what I'm saying. Here is a meaning on this level. Here is a meaning on this level. Here is a meaning on that level. So I did a symphonic score for the Amida, for the first blessing, to show what do we do with the body, what do we do with the mind, because it's not simple. You know, we have all these, all these layers are active in there. So kavana is the ability to keep steering and being aware of all those layers. Imagine I'm in the cockpit of an airplane, revving up the engines, and I'm checking all the, the gauges at this point, you know? So before I take off, I want to know, are my gauges on, you know? Am I, am I getting the feedback and so on? So that would be the way in which we would use our kavanot to say, is my body ready? And then we do Birchot HaShachar. Is my heart ready? And that's we, we do Psukhe De Zimra. Is my mind ready? And that's we do Kriyat Shema. Finally, we come to the Amida and we, do, we offer that prayer at that point. And so that's the way in which we attune, bring all these things together. There are some things that we don't want to ask you with a lot of kavana. The Kabbalists are very, very clear that they have a hand has five fingers, a coin is like a point, and reaching out is like a vav. So they say, when you give tzedakah, it is yud hey vav hey. The coin is the yud, the fingers are that give are the he, the arm that stretches out is the vav, and the other he is the fingers that receive that. That's beautiful. So the question is, if you do all the mitzvahs, you are supposed to make a boche. You have to say a blessing. Thank you, God, for commanding me to put on film, for commanding me to, to uh, have the lulav and the esrik. Why don't we say, Asher al mitzvah 
So the answer is, never mind. I don't need your kavona. Here I need a lot more that you should actually do good for somebody else. Because could you imagine this guy says, oh yes, I want to give you tzedakah, you're very hungry, wait, I'm going to go to mikveh and I'm going, <laughs> I'm going for that thousand film and I'll make the broche and then I'll give you tzedakah so you should have something to eat. In the meanwhile, the, the guy can die. So you see that there, are, there is an element where it, the demands of you is called eight lasot la Hashem heferu Torah It's a time to do something for God. Let go of your Torah at this point. You know, you have to, this is more important uh, that you have to do. So there's kavana in this element too that says, um, I'm throwing the kavana away because my only intent at this point is that that person will not be hungry, that that person will get what he needs. There is another level of kavana. And that is to send merit. Sometimes you give some stocker, and uh, you're doing this because you want healing for somebody, you know. We have made a Mishaberach and Shul for someone to get healed. And then we give stocker, and the Kavana is that that should affect that. Okay? And we have that from stock or tatzel mimovis when you go uh, at funerals people would go with pushkas and say stock saves you from death the notion that they had is that this is the way you know this is the way you give back to the world that's what you're doing with the world so i might have a kavana why am i giving this stock because i would like such and such a result to come from that. Is it kosher to do that? Well, yes and no, you know. Sometimes they say, um, if you do this bishvil beni, that my child should, should, should get better and so on and so forth, uh, that that's not the best motivation. And on the other hand, I think it's a wonderful motivation, you know, because it takes for granted that the Rabbani Shlalem is real for us, and that we are saying, and that's what I need. Now, if you have been uh, around um, our culture the last five years, you may have come across the secret. Do you remember the secret? Mm -hmm. The secret was affinities, which is like saying, think of what you want, picture what you want, and the universe is going to give that to you. So here you have a kavana too. So could you imagine if the kavana would be for the healing of the planet and so on and so forth, if enough people were to make a battery for that, what that could achieve. So all of us can put our kavana together. So whoever is going to watch this, I want to invite us all to send some kavana to that. If there is somebody who needs a healing or whatever help from heaven, that my kavana is that this should be available to them at the time when they need it, and let us say, Amen. Okay, and now you can get started. I think I have a habit that was developed over many years of <clears throat> davening the whole, uh -huh. the whole thing. Yeah. And I found it very, very difficult even after the learning in the Keter Shem Tov, yeah. uh, to when you want to attach to the word and elevate the word with yourself yeah. in the middle of everything. And it stops you at that point from proceeding down the line of the page. Um, and I asked permission then, say, is that okay? And now I hear you saying it again, that it is okay. Not only that, but let me, let me put it to you this way. Um, Imagine you have to talk to me about something and you have a whole speech written out. And you come with your speech and I say, Shatzkele, I love you. Put the speech down. Uh, what's really on your mind? Okay? If God is real to a person, then the other thing falls away. You know, what? 
just tell me where are you what's what's for real for you okay the thing that uh, that's the big problem with public policy that if you make public policy that everything goes then it's no good so hanoch lanar al pidarko you have to you have to train a person and you entrain them like you were entrained and like I was entrained to daven the whole thing. And there are days when there's nothing else that we need or can do. And so we, knew, we need to do it that way. But when a moment of grace comes, like, it's like God says, never mind, I have a goodie to give to you. And you say, sorry, I got a daven, you know. I often feel this is like when I want to make fun about how people do the Haggadah. Daddy, daddy, why do we eat matzah? Shut up and read the Haggadah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's, that, that's, that's what it's like, you know, when, when you get it. Uh, 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 the whole purpose is when your child will ask you a question. And then you say, but we have this rigid thing that we have to do. It's such a pity. Yeah. Okay. You got something? I just love what you're just saying because a lot of times when I'm davening and I feel I have to see, say everything, it kills it for me. And I just sit there and the more I read it, the more I find that I'm not participating and not really finding what I'm looking for. Well, I want to say something about how I feel that we are not doing it right. Okay. The pews, the chairs, are a problem because they become right away uh, the, the attractor for the tushy. So you got to sit down. And then people, what they do, some people like in the back and so on and so forth. What would be if around the baltfila, the people would stand around the baltfila, and as he begins and they would all raise their voice a little bit, you understand? It would take off. It would be so much different. And then I don't, need, then I don't think that you need necessarily to go your own way because you'll be caught up in the, in, in the rhythm of what's going on. And when I watch Reb Mark at times, beginning with a, with a rhythmic thing and everybody joins in, that that's wonderful. So at that point, you don't want to say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm going to do my own, right? Then you're caught, you're drawn into it. But let's say, if it goes on, somebody says, um, and in between, nothing is happening. There's dead space. So uh, all you can do is race along from one end to the other, or you can say, no, I like poteach et yadecha umazbi alechol chayrat son. I like that sentence. You open up your hand and you satisfy every living being with what they need. Uh, I'm going to stick with that sentence. Or karov adonai lechol korav lechol asher yikravu bemis. God is so close to those who call him the truth. I really mean it, dear God. Are you close to me? You know? A whole other thing than, than rushing. Okay, anybody else? Please. Well, now I hate to say on the one hand and yeah. on the other hand, Go ahead. and on the one hand and on the other hand, there is a challenge that comes sometimes in the in the matbeat fila. Sometimes I'll see something and it challenges me to think about it and ask myself, what is my consciousness about that? And I have conversations with Hashem about things that maybe I wouldn't think to, to converse about, especially in the parts of the Amidah, in the Bakashot, where we talk about the judges of old and Tzemach David and all of that. And I start to talk to Hashem. I, I say, you know, maybe, maybe we should be careful how we pray to you. Maybe you're giving us what we prayed for because maybe they weren't so good. Why are we doing this? Or, you know, maybe you took this away from us because you're trying to tell us that a different paradigm would be better. Maybe you're not punishing us. And I, and I, I question um, pieces of history and pieces of my impression of history sometimes in, in, the, in the course of that tefillah also. So, 
and then the meaning of the prayers have changed over time for me also as I've had different experiences at a certain time suddenly I'll say ah that's that really speaks to me now whereas at another time it didn't so for me there's a benefit to allowing myself the freedom in prayer to sit under the talit and, and just have a conversation or fall on something, but also a benefit to go through the, the tefillah as well as a way of uh, kind of figuring out where I am on the traditional bakashot issues. It depends a lot on what you have been paying attention to. Exactly. Give you an example. An issue is coming up at the Supreme Court. And so I say the words, but the words are for me like an aide de memoir. Don't forget to pray about justice. That's what this one means. Don't forget to pray about the ecology and the economy in Baruch Aleinu. Don't forget to pray about uh, all the people who are doing good work in the world, uh, you know, Allah Tzadikim. So that's what I call illustrative, not normative. And I think that's so important to recognize that a lot of Torah is illustrative and not normative. And there are some people who always claim it's normative. Right. It's normative, it's normative. And it can't work anymore. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why, why am I spending time talking about Davenology? Because I want it to be something that will help people in their relationship with God. Yeah. Anything from you? I find myself having the opposite situation of you. Of, of I go to the extreme of you know only doing his spodidus, of only yeah. doing it from my heart. That I never, I almost do structure, and I almost sometimes miss the structure. But I've conditioned myself to throw it, throw it away in toto. You know, so you know I struggle with that. Let me say that I borrow from psychological sophistication then I know that there are things that are individual differences. A jock will daven differently than a visceratone, you know? A, uh, a cerebratonic person will be so happy just to contemplate echad for an hour, you know? So there are the individual differences to begin with. Then there is not only the, 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 that difference that has to do with body type and so on, there is also with mind types. So some people are more right brain, some people are more left brain. A left brainer will want to say everything as is in the book, and when the right brain is there, I'll want to go into another place. I want to daydream more. You know, I want to, I want to have my enchantment with God. I want to tell you that that's the, that's the saddest thing today, that there's so little enchantment. If I were to walk into, uh, let's say in Krakow, I walked into the shul of the Ramo, and I had the sense of walking on tiptoe. It's not like when I go to, let's say, to Sharit Sedek, a big synagogue with all the plaques of people who have donated, which has now become a bar mitzvah factory, you know, and, and nothing more is happening there. And that's one possibility. But when you come into a place that is so filled, and you begin to feel, oh, the Ramo is here, the Megala Mukas is here, these are the people who davened in, in, in that place, and they're still, their vibe is still around. So, that has to do with the enchantment. When people would go out on Friday afternoon and they would say, uh, let's go outside into the field and meet the Shabbos queen. That's enchantment, you know. And Nebuch, it's much easier to have enchantment in the hills of Judea. There was a hotel in the hills of Judea and we once had a wonderful, wonderful a week of study there, and you can see Shabbos uh, is coming in. 
This, you can almost see from there to the Mediterranean where the sun is sinking in. And you can smell the field there and so on and so forth. Uh, you live, you live in, a, in a fairy tale, as it were. And if you can't at least once a week go into the fairy tale, your, your life is going to be too dry. So that's an important part. So, so we have body type and we have which kind of a brain a person has. Then comes the other part, which is, to what am I best attuned? Um, there is some music that'll make me want to, to, to get deeper into Shabbos. I did a um, CD that I call Prelude for Rendezvous with the Beloved. That's the, that kind, that's the language, right? So that's my... Shabbos audio mikveh, you know, uh, I hear that, it, it just gets my juices going and so on and so forth. So that has to do with enchantment. And wherever it's gotten to be so prosaic, <clears throat> you might say, what's the difference between chsidim and misnagdim? You would say the prosaic and the enchanted in, in a way, that's, that's the stuff. And more than anything, we need it today. And there's another reason why we need it today because hardly any Jew today is a Jew because he can't help it. We're all Jews by choice. It's not only the people who have become uh, converts that are Jews by choice. We're all Jews by choice. You see how you're using your choices, you know? You're using your choices. We're all using our choice. And that's a way in which we can really say, what can I give you, Rabbi Nishlam? I choose you. Instead of saying, Ato b'chartono, ani b'charti b'cha, you know, I've chosen you. Ready? So I grew up with a conservative Jewish education, and um, 10 years ago I got into Buddhist meditation practice and have been practicing regularly since then. And I started to notice little by little that the majority of my uh, meditation teachers were Jewish. And um, so when we talk about being Jewish by choice, I understand that on the level of kind of being uh, explicitly and kind of externally Jewish and having Jewish practices. And, um, but I also felt that I don't consider myself as someone who has really a, a prayer practice necessarily in the way that I think a lot of times that's meant. But I started to realize that I think I do and I don't acknowledge that I do. Um, and yet now I'm starting to kind of fill in the pieces of bringing back more of the Siddur and, and incorporate it in that way. But um, I'm not sure what or if there's a question here except um, around, um, I don't know. It has to do with grounding. You know, if uh, Jack Cornfield says, after the ecstasy, the laundry, you know, or Sylvia Burstein, and I go to all the Jews that are in Buddhism, I see that they have really gotten to ground things. And they were not so much interested in the abstract there, but to say, now let's go, where are we? The strange thing is that there's something like that in Zen, and, and Rinzai Zen too, you know, that says, don't go uh, highfalutin, do it. And when I hear the Dalai Lama saying, um, what's most important is we should have a secular ethic, you know, what he means to say is something empirical. Uh, karma is, a, in a way, a secular ethic. It doesn't say God is going to punish you. It says what you're doing causes something for you, and so on and so forth. So he's talking about that. But when it comes to that kind of understanding, I look at Bernie, uh, Bernie Roshi. Here is somebody who was taught by his teacher given to be the lineage holder. And then he realized that that's not what he wanted to do. He turned this over to someone else and he started to make a Bowery retreats, homeless retreats, taking people to Auschwitz and so on. Why is that? Because you see, this is I don't even want to say that this is something we can be proud of. I think this is given into our nature. When I look um, 
at the way in which uh, Rahm Emanuel, for instance, you know, making sure that he he can do what he can do for Tikkun Olam to be the right hand of the president and to do to do things. And so when I look at um, Bernanke, here is somebody who has uh, all the uh, keys, if you will, to to the economy in his hand, and how he has tried to steer in such a way that things should come out right. So I think as a certain pride I can take from our genetic endowment. And if you look uh, and see, something remarkable has happened. Could you imagine if in the Catholic Church, uh, Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross would have married and had children? What happened was that the Church culled each time the best people and take them out of the genetic pool by making sure that they should be celibate. How did we do it? We had a yeshiva, and there was a rich man who had a daughter. So he went to the yeshiva to find the right kind of a groom for his daughter, so there should be Torah, Gdula, Bemokim, Echot, so that, that the power to affect things and the learning should be in one place. And that goes for generations and generations and generations until it comes out in an Einstein. You know, even if these people are not necessarily Torah observing, nevertheless, if you go into the 30s and you look who were the social organizer of the unions and so on and so forth, you find how many Jews were there. You would speak about the children who were raised in red diapers, they called them, the red diaper babies, because their parents were socialists and they wanted, they believed that they could make the world better. And they were doing this from a secular thing. So I tell you a funny story, and with that I'll stop. In Winnipeg, where I used to live, there was the uh, provincial uh, parliament. In the provincial parliament, uh, districts had, every district had someone chosen there. And there was a district that was called the lower north end of uh, Winnipeg. That's where Jews, Ukrainians, Russians, and Poles lived. And there was a guy who had a um, travel agency and he sent packages of food into Russia and stuff like that. And his name was Moshe Gray. His real name was Gor Arye, but he, called, he was known as Moshe Gray, and he was a member of the parliament. Moshe Gray and his buddy would go to the Schwitz on Shabbos morning, and when we finished Daven, and he would come in to make Kiddush with us in the Lubavitcher Shul. <laughs> that, that was his, his way of doing Shabbos, Moshe Gray. So Moshe Gray calls me one day and says, you know, every year I give a talk uh, in parliament, and it's printed out in the Hansard, the, the uh, Parliament um, Journal, whatever it is, uh, it enters into the, into the record. And I've been saying this for years, that I'm a, a socialist, I'm a socialist, but I'm not a socialist for Marx, I'm a socialist for Messiah. <laughs> That's how he said to me. Then he asked, but I'm tired already of being a socialist for Messiah, could you help me to be a socialist from Jeremiah, maybe? And the last year that I was dealing with him, he was a socialist from Pirkei Avos. <laughs> so it is so wonderful. Do you see what I'm saying? There's something that filters through that says, I want to make life easier for people. I want to make it more secure. I want people to have food and shelter. So may we all have security and food and shelter. And no more. Amen. <laughs>